and you now have all the solutions to all the different types of problems in one spot. So in that hour or two before the test, rather than going over new material, you can just go over the past stuff and review it again. Another big thing is future students that need help with things, you've probably forgotten exactly how to solve it, so you can just look at this, and then again, you have a step-by-step -step solution. The final big thing is right now, we're getting close to finals week, and so when we take our finals test, if you have any collaborative, like, like comprehensive tests, you now have a test that has three or four times the material as the past tests. And it's hard to know everything that'll be on that test. But if you've archived what's been on the past tests, you now have all of the information, so you don't have to worry about forgetting what might be on the final. You have it all. And that's the really big perk of archiving all of this. So what should be on a crib sheet? I've narrowed it down to four things that I normally put on my crib sheets. You put down the equations. If you're comp sci, this would kind of be like the syntax. This is like the set in stone solid stuff. Then you put down your processes. So this is like how you use the equation, how you get the variables that you plug into the equation. For comp sci, this might be like how you would write certain types of code and the process that you go about doing that. And then some general reminders. These are things that you might mess up. So when you're practicing problems, maybe you forget to turn degrees to radians. That's a really common one that I put on my crib sheets. Another really common thing that I put down on reminders is check your units because we've all made that mistake. Or like in a lot of the stuff recently, we've been having tests where diameter and radius, we use them both. And so making sure that I grab the correct one. These are just simple things that you can mess up and it screws the entire problem up. And then the last thing is fun facts. So these could be exceptions to certain types of problems, maybe like a sub-process that you can narrow down into one small thing. If you know there's multiple choice problems, you might be able to like explain how to solve a multiple choice problem in a fun fact. Just a really quick, small thing. So the most important one for the crib sheet, though, is the process. So when you're solving out the process, you'll see that I have a step-by-step -step solution for my process right here. So I have step one, step two, step three. It's really important that you guys do this on your own. A lot of teachers are really nice in the fact that they actually give you the whole step-by-step -step process for it. But if you just follow that, it doesn't necessarily mean you understand it. If you can solve two or three problems and actually go through the process of developing your own step-by-step -step solution, a lot of times that'll benefit you a lot more. You'll be able to word it in ways that make more sense to you. Because a lot of times they'll use wacky terms that we don't actually try to learn the definition to. And you can use simpler terms. So these, these are two examples of like crib sheets. So another big thing is if you're making a crib sheet, don't necessarily try to put it all on one page for the test. So this is a crib sheet right here. This is actually two pages front and back. And when I did this, I didn't worry about putting it all into one page. If you look, I have a lot of empty spaces. It's a lot easier to look at. And then if I wanted to, say, put this all on one page for the test, I could consolidate and put it all on one. And then you can also see I have like little reminders. I box them in red so that it's really obvious this is where those quick, small things that I might mess up on. And also, feel free to be like sarcastic with yourself and make like snarky little remarks or jokes. It makes it more fun. And also, when you're taking a test and you're really stressed out and nervous, it really helps to be able to see a joke or some sass in your market yourself. And it kind of makes you smile. So I would greatly encourage including those just to lighten the mood while you're taking the test. I put a lot of sass in your marks to myself on my crib sheets. Um, so there's two big methods that you can go through to make a crib sheet. The first method is the cram. This is what a lot of people like. And then the second method will basically be how you can make a crib sheet while you're doing your homework. It's a lot better, but you really need a lot of discipline to do it. So the first method, essentially, you want to try to get three tests together. And then if you can't get that many tests together, you can get some homework together. And you're going to use these resources to try to determine what types of problems will be on the test. So the other thing you need is a lot of time. Whether you want it to take a lot of time or not, it's going to. So you just have to kind of accept the fact that it is time, kind of like a time commitment. And this is replacing your studying. This is how you're going to study. So you don't have to worry about doing this and studying. So the additional thing, so after you've gotten all of your tests, your homework, you have your time, you're sitting down, you're ready, you lay all of them out, and you just go through the first page of the test, per se, and you'll see that there's a lot of commonalities. So when a teacher makes a test or a professor, a lot of times, I, they're not... They're really consistent. They're predictable. A teacher wants you to know certain things. And therefore, those things don't really change between semesters. So a lot of times you can predict what's going to happen. A lot of teachers, if they say only have five problems on their test, four of them will be really, really similar, and the last one might be a little different. And normally they go in the same order as far as topics go. 
So you can actually look at the first problem, and it'll be a certain type of problem. Look at the second problem, it'll be a different type of problem. Bigger tests that have a lot more questions, normally you can go through and you can figure out where they match up. But normally you'll find there's a lot of repetition between tests. And that's essentially the point of laying them all out and trying to find that. Now that you know the types of problems that are on the test, you can start determining your process. So you'll essentially write out how to solve a problem. You'll look at how it's already done. If you have past tests that are fully solved, don't worry about solving it yourself. Like, it's already done. Use this up as an opportunity to see how it's done. So taking the time to solve a test if you don't know how to solve it isn't worth it. It's better to learn how to do it and then solve the problems. Otherwise, if you just start trying to do it without actually knowing how to solve the problem, you might confuse yourself, and that'll actually be counterintuitive, and it'll take a lot longer because then you have to figure out how you've confused yourself. So looking at other people that have taken tests, looking at what they did, and then taking your last test or two last tests and actually doing them now that you know how to do it is a great way to end. So then the final thing is when you take this last test, use it as an opportunity to find the reminders, the small tricks and things that you forget to do. So when you take that test and you forget to put a semicolon on the end of something as a comp sci, like that can really mess up your program in C++. So now you can make a comment, oh, don't forget your semicolon. So then the second method is to do it while you're doing your homework. This one's pretty nice in the fact that like, when you get to test time, you don't have to spend several hours to cram. The downside of this is you have to take homework a lot more seriously because now you're using that as the way you get ready for tests. A lot of people don't want to do that. A lot of people just want to try to get their homework done. That's kind of reasonable, but again, like it can save you a lot of time if you do it while you're doing your homework. So when you're doing the homework, you essentially will take the first problem and you will actually step-by-step -step write out every single thing you do in words. And you want to be as detailed as you can with it. So then you skip to your second problem. With the second problem, you want to solve it again using that process and see if there's anything that you can cut out because it's common sense, it's unnecessary. See if there's any things that you can describe better, new things that you might be able to add in. And normally by the time you do your third or fourth problem, you've gotten to the point where you pretty much have a process that'll work for this problem. After that, you want to keep, you want to finish the homework. As you finish the homework, you're going to get into like special exceptions, cool little tricks that your teachers require to use to solve problems. When that happens, you're going to end up having to put in fun facts and sub processes. So this would be a quick description on how to do like a special case in a situation and small things. Let's see. I actually have an example of that. So in this one right here, this entire half is based off of deflection for a test. And so I have my general process to solve it, and then I have a bunch of small subsections where I talk about some of the special cases. So in this one, it's an entirely different process. It's a sub-process, right? Step one, two, three. And then in this one, you can see this is just a small little fun fact that I used to remember. So it's really critical that you actually go through and write out all those step processes and write out all the steps and words. It helps so much to actually write it out in person. And then the last thing is, while you're solving the homework, write down any mistakes you make. That's the other big perk of doing the second method. Normally you solve a lot more problems this way, and since you're taking it seriously, you're a lot better at recording the mistakes that you make, and you can make better reminders. So then the last thing is do's and don'ts for PIP sheets. So some big things are organize it how you want. Don't feel like you have to make it colorful. If you want to make it colorful, do that. If you want to box things, underline things, sometimes you want to put stars around things, figure out how you feel comfortable organizing it so that it pulls your eyes to it. We all enjoy looking at different types of things. So then the next thing is make sure you show your crib sheet to other people. One of the big perks of making a crib sheet is when you go into your friend group to study, you have your crib sheet already made, and you can see if you're forgetting things. You've taken the time to figure out everything that's on the test. And now you can be proven wrong. The other big thing is your teachers will have lead sessions the night before the test, right? So a big don't is don't wait till the night before to make your crib sheet. Make it two nights before, and then you can take your crib sheet into the lead session, and your teacher can tell you all the things that you're forgetting. And then you can finish making it that night. The other thing is if you make it two nights before, it's a big time commitment, so you might be a, a little late, especially if you're using the cramming method. And if you cram for it, now the next night, you can actually sleep for your test. So a big thing is don't wait till the night before. And then another cool thing is make sure you guys include diagrams and pictures. Like Again, like it makes it look nicer. It makes it easier to understand what the equations are if you have like a picture that shows what each variable represents. And then a final like don't is no matter what, don't copy anything directly from the PowerPoint. Take the time to write it out and figure it all out yourself. 
determine the process to solve each type of problem yourself, put it in your own words so that you understand it and you know you don't, like, you're not just copying, you're putting something that you fully comprehend. The exception to that is, it's perfectly fine to put, like, reminders and equations. A lot of teachers, like, give those, don't worry about, like, copying those, that's fine. And if a teacher goes out of their way to tell you reminders or fun facts and small things like that, and they're like, hey, you should think about this for your test, like, when you're in lecture, that's something you want to immediately switch to your crib sheet and just immediately put down so you know, okay, the teacher said this is a mistake people made. Now I don't have to worry about it. And then when you're doing your homework, you don't have to worry about it because you've already made a note. So this is, like, another example. Both of these were for the exact same test. This is the third Mackey Mac test. That one's really colorful. You can see a lot more diagrams. My friend Ellie made that. You guys know Ellie. And she did a really good job making it. She organize it so you can see her one, two, three processes and steps that she used to write them out. And you can see how she uses diagrams to help understand things better. In mine, you can see that I used my review from test two. So there were some like carryover topics from test two to test three. And when I did this, I actually took material from my test two crib sheet and reused it on my test three crib sheet. So I didn't have to worry about going back and figuring out how to write all that out. I could just immediately put that in. And I even knew one of the reminders, so I boxed the things that I forgot. So you can see right here, this is something that I figured like might trick me up on the test. So I was able to remember that from test two. So then, are there any questions or comments? So you'd recommend making a crib sheet even if you're not allowed to use it on the test? Absolutely. I, I make them for all of my tests. Even if I can't use it for that test, just making it a lot of times helps you figure out everything that's going to be on it. So normally when I go into tests, I know all the problems that are going to be on it, and I know the general process for it, which makes it a lot easier. The other thing is finals comes around, and when you have three or four big tests that have three or four times the material as a normal test, I have all of that information that I can look at. I don't have to worry about forgetting things that may have been on past tests that I'm not aware of. Yeah. Uh, when, when would you not use a crib sheet for a test? So, I, I always use a crib sheet for a test. There, there actually like hasn't been a test that I didn't go out of my way to make a crib sheet for. Um, even if a teacher gives me an equation sheet, a lot of times I'll make my own sheet because I can describe the process and how to use that equation. And I'll even go out of my way to put the equation on there even though I know I have the equation on their equation sheet because now I know what process matches up with what equation. Did you, did you have something in mind like a time when you might not? No, no, I was wondering yeah. if you had a time. No, so where... like even, even comp sci classes, like when I was start first taking comp sci classes, my first thought was like I wouldn't be able to use it because it's so different. But like even then I was able to like find correlations between the two and how like equations are close to syntax and how like a lot of like comp sci tests will have like a type of program that they really like to ask and you can put that down instead of a process, like how you write certain types of programs. Yeah. Are uh, crypt sheets applicable to like... Uh writing speeches or papers for like your more liberal arts classes? Yeah, so even like writing papers and stuff, they have a structure in the way that they want you to write out your paper. There can even be like certain words that you know the teacher likes and certain topics. A lot of teachers in English are somewhat opinionated in liberal studies, and so you can try to specialize like these are the things you need to make sure you don't talk about. Here's some things that you need to make sure you do talk about. And like actually speaking of that, another really cool thing is if you get into like fluids or like heat transfer classes or thermo, you'll have a lot of like word problems, or even in like physics too, word problems that'll have like a single word that is like critical to the entire problem. So it might be like isentropic or something like that. And that one word you need to know what that means for the problem. You can put that down as like a fun fact and know like, oh, this word means that. And if you can put all those down together, then even if you can't take them to the test, you at least know the four or five words that you have to look for. Do you use your crib sheet on every test they let you bring it in? Yeah. Like, are there any tests where, like, you were, you learned it so well making the crib sheet you don't even need it? So, a lot of, I, I always take it in. There are tests where, like, going through the process of making it, I'll know it well enough that I won't. Normally, if I have extra time, I'll, like, look at the crib sheet to make sure that I followed everything exactly, like, the way that I said and I didn't skip over anything. Um, so, I, sometimes, yeah, making it is just enough that I don't even have to use it, but... Normally, you end up at least using the equations or the reminders occasionally or fun facts. Mm -hmm. Has there been a time when this method, like, just so for so whatever reason, didn't work? Or uh, you didn't get a good grade on the test? So, the only time that I, I generally don't do super well in classes is when I don't do this. So, like, 
See, psychology and English, I never did this on, and I totally should have because I would have done a lot better, um, especially psychology. And so, I, as of now, I haven't had any classes where like this general approach doesn't work. It kind of is a pain in the butt when teachers don't give you practice tests at all, and when teachers don't provide like tests for you to look at from the past. And that's why sometimes you have to resort to like looking back at your homework to figure out how to make this. And it's a little less effective when you don't have past tests, but normally like you can still figure it out a lot, like well enough with homework, and it's still better than not doing it. Yeah. This can be emailed out. Yeah, I'll email out. Um, have you considered uploading your crib sheets to the file system slash the so website? I'm going to, I'm going to wait till the end of the semester when I finish getting them all in. I actually lost all of my crib sheets this summer. I was making them on my Surface, and then my Surface files got lost, so I lost all of them, which makes me really sad, actually, Yeah. because I had yeah. some really good, like, DiffyQ, like, crib sheet mm. files. But... All right. Cool. Thank mm -hmm. you.